Okay, thanks for joining everyone. So we're going to cover the topic of um, your journey, uh, your Citrix journey to the cloud. Uh, we'll just go through the agenda items. So we're going to cover off, I guess, introducing what Citrix Cloud actually is, its architecture and benefits, what's new in Citrix Cloud, the different Citrix Cloud deployment types and some considerations um, migrating to Citrix Cloud, public cloud, you know, costing how much it will get you for example, in Azure to place your uh, workload there. We'll go through um, some cost models around that and some demos um, around Citrix Cloud. And then finally, a Q&A session um, if we've got time at the end. So let's just kick off. First, I'll just go a bit about me. So uh, my name is David Wilkinson. I'm an EEC architect for Novosco. I've been in the Citrix um, kind of technology area for the last 14, 15 years. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, I run a blog called walkieit.com. I've just recently become a Citrix CTP as of 2019. Um, obviously, i um, got a Citrix certified um, expert and I've probably been one of the first people um, certified on the Citrix Cloud specific exams around ZenApp and Zen Desktop service on Citrix Cloud. So, well, kick off with the you know Citrix evolution to the cloud. So we think back 10, 15 years ago when virtualization uh, was really um, only starting to begin. Before that, we had physical servers uh, with Citrix presentation server 4.5 and even older with, with Metaframe XP um, of those days where, where virtualization wasn't possible. We've kind of come through the years, you know, to virtualization becoming the norm, you know, with VMware, with Hyper-V, Zen server and Nutanix um, coming to the fold really over the last five, 10, 15 years. And then public cloud in the last you know, six, seven years has, has really kind of started to kick off with a lot of the players such as Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, um, Google Cloud Platform, et cetera. And this is around the same time that Citrix kind of um, decided that they wanted to become really um, a cloud company or a cloud first company. Uh, in which case they introduced um, three, three and a half years ago, um, Citrix Cloud. And I guess everyone's on the journey um, with Citrix um, to Citrix Cloud or are thinking about the ability of moving to Citrix Cloud or generally are moving in the direction where public cloud is, is seen as the, the kind of um, the next generation of where uh, computing is going. So what is Citrix Cloud? Um, there's maybe a lot of misconceptions out there that Citrix Cloud is actually just a replacement for virtual apps, virtual apps and desktop or Zen app and Zen desktop, but would have been known as before. It's actually quite a lot more. Um, so if we look at the, the screen that we have in front of us, we can see there's a Citrix workspace, uh, which includes, you know, um, share file. It includes the virtual apps premium service, um, the virtual desktops service. Um, it includes um, SaaS based apps publishing. Um, we also obviously have the, the, the apps and desktop virtualization, which we all know and love. That obviously comes with some additional benefits around um, secure browser service, um, which is essentially a, a kind of hived off Linux environment that Citrix provides you for secure browsing. Uh, where that machine is, I guess, non-persistent. It's outside of your network, but you can run web pages uh, in a secure way. Endpoint management um, is obviously an additional uh, service that's included in it. Endpoint management would have been known probably as Zen Mobile before, and that's your, your enterprise mobility, your MDM, your MAM, um, having that um, Citrix app on your mobile phones to control uh, access to email or access to applications. We've obviously got next and the file sharing collaboration. Pre, you know, it's called Share File Services. It, it's actually been renamed to Citrix Files now. So it's it's really the content and collaboration service. We then have the app delivery and cloud networking. So this is where Citrix will actually provide you with a, um, I guess, a standard gateway in the cloud. Um, and allow you to um, access that gateway to then access your um, your desktops um, and your um, your servers um, through a published application. This means that you don't need to actually invest in, in any remote access solution, go out and buy any Netscalers, for example. 
Um, and then obviously we've got um, some all our partner services such as the, the license usage and insights, which have really improved over the last few years. And then finally, um, to the right there, we see some of the um, the workspace automation, the provision of Office 365, and Linux-based uh, VDA agents actually getting deployed. So to say, I guess, that Citrix Cloud is, is just the replacement for virtual apps and desktops isn't quite doing it justice. It is, is a lot more um, th than just that. Uh, and I guess um, that is, seems to be a common misconception out there. So if we look at our traditional on-premises data center deployment, um, usually managed by, you know, managed service providers or customers themselves. We've got the traditional um, delivery controller there in the middle, um, which is based on a Windows VM, which talks to a database. Um, it is surrounded obviously by storefront um, for the, the GUI can uh, access into it. Um, the gateway there is for um, remote access in or load balancing at the studio to control what you're actually provisioning and deploying, director, uh, how you're actually monitoring that environment, and then the license um, server itself. And then, as we can see, the um, the, ver the um, bottom of the delivery controller there, we can see the virtual app servers and the virtual desktops and the, the hyper uh, visor level. And obviously, a lot of that is surrounded by the um, Active Directory uh, component for the authentication. How does that change, I guess, when we, we move into a Citrix cloud architecture? If we look at the, the kind of split now, um, where what sits on your on-premises data center, um, managed by you know a partner such as Novosco or, or a customer owned, you can see the, the hypervisor can still be retained within that the control of that particular customer, where the VDAs are actually installed in the VDIs and your Active Directory. But what we see fundamentally above that is anything in the previous slide um, that was above would have been talking to the director. It, it now talks to, I guess, the, the foundation of the, the Citrix cloud service, and that's the cloud connector. That cloud connector then brokers your connection to the delivery controller. That delivery controller is actually managed by Citrix and is part of the Citrix cloud service. And you can see the top left, you know, it will provide you with a, a storefront um, web page for users to authenticate. It'll provide that gateway service that we talked about in uh, previous slides. Uh, you're able to access via, uh, via the Citrix Cloud Management uh, web page, you know, the studio, just like um, you do now at the moment on an on-premises solution. Um, director is there obviously doing exactly the same job it did before monitoring um, the uh, state of the environment and obviously um, the the license server is is contained within that cloud um, and you'll get more license usage stats um, based on recent updates and I guess then finally is if you look at that database side of things the database then sits within Citrix cloud and is managed by Citrix and if you think from a point of view if you were to deploy a SQL database and the, li the licensing costs of Citrix um, or sorry, a Microsoft SQL uh, licensing database to be there, that's actually removed from your on-premises data center and, and Citrix cover that as part of the Citrix cloud service themselves. So kind of going through a summary of that is, you know, the control plane as it's kind of commonly known as is, del you know, the delivery controller, the storefront, the gateway, the SQL server, the studio, the license server, and um, director. Um, it's deployed obviously within Citrix Cloud. You have very little access apart from the studio and director to the underlying infrastructure because that's managed by Citrix. And then we look at the resource plane or what it's commonly known as is the resource location. And that's where your, your virtual apps um, servers reside, your virtual desktop VMs, your Active Directory and the Citrix Cloud connector. And uh, that's, you know, on, that can be on-premise premises. Um, it could be in a public or private hybrid cloud infrastructure. It really is, I guess, your choice of, of where that resource location or that resource plane actually exists. If we look at the, uh, I guess, the foundation of what um, the, the brokerage from the resource location to um, the Citrix cloud, it, it's all surrounded around these cloud connectors. Um, it's recommended that we have two per data center. 
Um, the reason being is Citrix will update these cloud connectors. They will push out changes and these boxes can reboot at any time. So obviously in the event of one rebooting, you want to have another one available there to broker your connection. Um, if you look at what ports are actually required, um, only port 443 outbound is required to provide this full set of infrastructure. So for example, um, if you wanted to access your gateway service in the top left, you would log in externally via your Active Directory credentials and your two-factor authentication. You would then access this, that Citrix Gateway Service Broker. You will then go down via the cloud connector from Citrix Cloud down to your desktop and server VMs. And that is all essentially achieved out of an outbound TCP 443 HTTPS connection. Um, and that is how easy it is to deploy from, I guess, a, um, a network point of view, maybe from a firewall point of view, because a lot of the times by default, the TCP 443 and HTTPS would be um, widely open um, for th things such as updates anyway. So it's a fairly easy thing to deploy in, in any existing environment um, without major um, fundamental changes. Um, and it, as I kind of covered, it, it is the foundation of the Citrix cloud architecture itself. And if we look at sizing around those particular cloud connectors, uh, the kind of recommendation is around uh, 500 server OSs, which would be your traditional terminal server or RDSH, or 5,000 desktop uh, operating systems, uh, which would be your Windows 10 kind of VDI environment. So kind of going to go through some of the benefits, I guess, of moving to Citrix Cloud. Um, you know, it's simple, as I kind of covered off. Uh, it's not a fundamentally hard thing to deploy. Um, once you decide on where your resource locations are, have the infrastructure ready for that, um, stand up the, your VMs for the cloud connectors, actually getting it up and running is a fairly quick and easy thing to do. Um, and that, you know, can happen in hours, not weeks. Um, so, you know, it, upgrading the, the kind of Citrix component is easier. Um, and that way, you know, Citrix actually do the management of those updates. They will roll out uh, the updated version of current release within the cloud before they actually release um, to the on-premises product. So you're always going to be evergreen from a, a Citrix control plane point of view. And that will allow you to have the benefits of using the latest and greatest features. Um, you don't need, you know, those upgrade cycles of every um, six or 12 months where you have to upgrade to the latest version, take some outages, you know, in order to do that properly. You know, it's all managed and done by Citrix and, uh, and maintained by those. Um, we covered off there with how fast it is, you know, taking, you know, hours, not weeks to do. The flexibility really of it, you know, is, you know, it can be a hybrid cloud deployed model. Um, you know, you can deploy it within your public cloud infrastructure if you have any. Um, it can be deployed uh, within your existing on-premises data center. It's kind of really your choice where you deem it to be, I guess, the most efficient, the most cost effective, or um, if you want flexibility with public cloud, you know, uh, uh, on a consumer basis, you know, pay and go basis, you can add um, these hybrid models of having the majority of your uh, infrastructure or your workload deployed um, on premises. And then you can burst via public cloud, maybe for busy times of the year, really depending on your, your business requirements. So it does give that flexibility of allowing you to kind of choose where you want to deploy the infrastructure. It's not fundamentally forcing anyone onto the cloud. You know, Citrix were pretty, um, pretty good they understand that actually the cloud journey isn't going to take a year or two years it's going to take five plus years and they've adapted their products to make sure that this hybrid world can exist and, and allow the you know the users and the businesses to move when they're ready when their apps are ready so that's why they, they allow that flexibility and that's why they've kind of um, included as one of their key benefits um, we talk about security you know, it, you basically keep the apps where they are. The desktop and data is still under your control. So where you decide to place your um, your workload environments, your, your server and desktop um, VDAs is totally within your own choice. 
Um, and it's, you know, if you're bound by certain restrictions, government restrictions, data restrictions, placing Citrix Cloud there in the middle of that doesn't actually um, involve any data being put in Citrix Cloud. It only, you know, maintains a small um, amount of um, data going back and forth. Um, that is, you know, enough just to the brokering. The, the data still resides within your location. Um, scalable so it's it's easy to scale up and scale down so the joys of public cloud i guess are that you can deploy 100 vms in a very quick amount of time and that um, can be um, done very very quickly when it's actually required so if you give an example of maybe a, a utilities company who will be traditionally more busy during the winter months you know a company like that could actually scale up um, their kind of workload environment. And at the end of that period, scale down, that wouldn't mean that they would need to go and invest on that workload in the, the, the traditional um, way of buying servers, racking them, that usually take weeks to happen. So, you know, it offers that, you know, easy way to scale up and down. Um, it's cost effective from the point of view, it, it provides less hardware footprint on premises. You don't need to cover off um, the delivery controllers and, and the various other rules that you had there. And you're, you're leaving what needs to be on premises at bare minimum and obviously removing the, the SQL um, requirement because that is now moved into the, um, it's now moved into the cloud. Um, Everything is guess, kept evergreen, so you don't need to do any more upgrades at the back end. You know the new features are available automatically, and, and Cedrix have come out and said it's they will deliver their features first in the cloud before releasing it um, to uh, the current release product that's available on premise. Uh, and I said the the previous reduction in costs, you know, the elimination of SQL as well. So that kind of covers off um, a lot of the key benefits and, and why moving to Cedrix Cloud actually works. So what changes in your environment? If you're an existing Citrix customer, you no longer manage the control uh, plane components. Um, it's you know deployed, upgraded, and maintained and owned by Citrix. So we spoke about the cloud connector. Um, we spoke about Citrix Cloud. That is all um, within their control of when it updates. Um, uh, the cloud connector itself is, is obviously um, hosted within the customer's data center or the resource location, but the, the updates are controlled by Citrix. So, you know, as I say, you're responsible for the upkeep and performance of that resource plane. So, you know, core Citrix components, the virtual app servers and the virtual desktop VMs are under your control. And, you know, you still manage the hypervisor and other supporting IT infrastructure, so the network, AD, etc. And where we covered there before, the Citrix Cloud Connector, it serves as your channel for communication between the control and the resource plane, and it's typically deployed in pairs uh, for highly availability. So there's no major changes from a, a kind of um, Citrix deployment point of view of, of how the previous versions of Citrix worked versus Cloud. Um, there's this addition of Citrix Cloud Connector uh, being added to do a lot of the brokering. So if we look at um, what options um, you have around public cloud. So at the moment, Citrix currently support AWS um, as a resource location with Citrix cloud connectors, obviously um, um, being placed within there. There is Microsoft Azure, which to be honest, seems to be eight out of 10 customers seem to be Microsoft Azure customers are definitely the most popular. Um, Oracle Cloud. Google Cloud Platform. And I guess if you look at the underlying, um, underneath the cloud there, you've got the Azure stacks, the hyper-converged infrastructure and your local virtualization. And that really covers off uh, a lot of the um, on-premise solutions. So as you can see, there's there's a wide options for public cloud and it really is down to each customer, which they deem the best option for them. Um, the most cost effective for them, or it could be down to what, what location they're actually based in, offers the best service from which cloud provider. If we look at some different um, view uh, options I've seen um, on deploying um, um, public cloud, um, what well, the first one really is extending. 
So we've got an existing on-premise um, customer with the traditional deployment that we all know and love. And actually, they want to extend in the Azure. Um, they'll create a VPN connection or express routes connection and consume that public cloud in that particular way. So that's where you, you aren't actually adjusting moving to Citrix Cloud, but you're just extending the benefits of the existing um, on-premise solution and, and touching into the public cloud. Um, that's one of the options, I guess, if you're an existing customer. We have the Citrix on Azure all-in, um, and that essentially is where you've actually lifted and shifted the whole Citrix environment that you have on-premise. You actually move those traditional features um, into um, the Azure subscriptions, so your storefronts, your net scalers, all the different VMs that you, you would do on-premise are then moved into um, into Azure, and then your clients obviously access that via secure VPN and, and express routes. And then the Citrix Cloud is kind of the third option where the Citrix control plane at the top um, is essentially where you've moved all your uh, your Citrix components, and then you decide what way that you want to deploy your resource locations depending on your own need. So you've got your Azure subscription called out on the left hand side there, and you've got your on-premises, in which case you've kind of um, you've, you're given the ability to to kind of um, adapt to um, either going into public cloud at your own pace or you know, staying on premises and still achieving some of the other benefits that Citrix Cloud does give you. If we look at different um, subscriptions available, so um, Citrix Cloud is a subscription-based service. Um, there's three different licensing types. So there's the workspace standard, um, which includes you know, the workspace experience, you know, access control, secure browser, and analytics. There's the secure works, or it's the workspace premium, um, subscription, and that includes your workspace experience, your workspace intelligence, your endpoint management, WEM access control, secure browser, analytics for access control, content collaboration, which is share file and analytics, and then finally the workstation premium plus. And this is your um, all the previous ones that we've called out for, including your virtual apps and desktops, including uh, your Citrix hypervisor. And there's some common misconceptions out there that there is no such thing as concurrency in cloud. Workspace Premium Plus is concurrent licensing. So it's obviously the most expensive license, but then again, so is concurrent on the traditional model. Um, but there is concurrent licensing in Citrix Cloud. Challenges that I've kind of seen to cloud adoption uh, kind of calling out five kind of key asks all the time. So not a, not everyone has migrated the virtual apps and desktop seven, believe it or not. Um, even though it's it's near in the end of its day from a supportability and end of life point of view, pe people haven't actually moved to it. Um, familiarity with the cloud deployment model is less. Um, cloud services are more expensive. Fears of security and compliance and reliability and performance concerns. And we could see there, um, a survey that was done around uh, last year around Citrix migration survey. You can see the, the kind of percentages of where people are in their migration um, stages. But bear in mind, this is obviously a year old at the moment. So we're just going to cover off some of those points. So not everyone has migrated the, the virtual apps and desktops. So as more organizations are upgrading, you know, the, the cloud adoption will increase. You know, it's it, it's the, the natural progression. You know, adoption of cloud service varies per industry and organization's maturity. So everyone is in a different stage of the journey. A lot of people are fairly well through it. Some people are only beginning to look at it. Um, that isn't necessarily a, a challenge, uh, but it's, you know, we, we have to recognize that um, People are, in, are in, a, in different stages, you know, financially in different stages from a public cloud point of view, from a, um, a confidence point of view. And um, some people we also have to bear in mind just may not want to move to cloud services as well. You know, um, it can be an attractive proposition when traditionally when renewing your traditional licenses. So whenever it comes to that lovely time of the year when the renewals happen on your, your subject subscriptions, Citrix will have had discussions or your, your partners will have had discussions um, with um, Citrix Cloud because 
it's pretty well known that Citrix are trying to move everybody into this subscription uh, based model and into Citrix cloud licensing. Um, they are beginning to make it attractive for existing on-premises customers to at least begin that journey. And I guess it's also shifting expenses, you know, from capex, you know, up from costs to more opex, and that's the the, the kind of general um, public cloud model um, that it, it's shifting in that way. Um, and there's actually a Citrix Cloud Success program included in your cloud subscription. So there is someone there from a Citrix point of view who will be dedicated to you in your Citrix journey to ensure that it's a success, you know, along with your partners, you know, such as Novosco, someone will be there from a, a Citrix point of view, uh, making sure the right strategies are being adopted, making sure where they can help with anything that they also provide assistance. Second one that we called out there previous was the familiarity with cloud deployment models is less. Actually, there's not a huge variation from a management con console point of view. If you look at um, Citrix Studio, that Citrix Studio actually exists in the cloud. It looks exactly the same. So there's not a lot of change from a manageability point of view. Yes, you do have some um, other elements that you need to consider, um, you know, such as Cloud Connector, but they are not generally managed in a way that you, end users would manage them. And Citrix are obviously trying to make cloud deployment simpler and easier for admins to try and evaluate. So trying to get one of those um, trials of Citrix Cloud can be temperamental. But where I've seen a lot of success in trying to get one of those trials approved is when you engage with your partners and you, those partners have discussions with Citrix and explain es essentially what your journey is going to be and why you're evaluating it. Like I've seen that speed up how long it takes to get that trial approved so you can actually go on and do a, point, uh, a proof of concept. Um, the feature um, comparisons between you know cloud uh, and on-premise is reducing. So I'm talking about the particular um, the virtual apps and desktop on-premises product and the cloud. Um, if I, if you were to ask me a year ago, there would have been a lot of gaps there um, around some of the features. A lot of that has been resolved um, in the past um, 12 months, and we'll probably cover that up, some of that off uh, in the next coming slides. And I guess the multiple cloud, you know, supported as well as traditional uh, DC deployment, uh, you know. Uh, that's helping, you know, with with um, the cloud deployment model. It's not restricting, in, you know, to one organization to have one set of skill set. It is, you know, adapting to what the customer wants to choose. Cloud services are more expensive. Okay, so first question I was asked: Do you actually understand how much your on-premises cost? So a lot of people are trying to compare apples for apples when actually they're not. So they will see. Azure, for example, is more expensive. Uh, if you're comparing the expense of a server versus an expense of a VM in Azure, you're not comparing like for like. So, you know, do you understand your true cost of your on-premise? Have you included the cost of the building or the the rental of the particular rack if, if it's rented out? Have you included the power into that cost? Have you included the AC? Have you included the refresh cycle? And so it's sometimes easy to say it's very expensive, but do you actually truly understand your, your own cost of providing a dumb premise? Um, because a lot of people will may, may not have that total cost um, per server, um, which is hard then to compare and say, well, is it more expensive? So are you moving to Citrix Cloud for cost savings? If you are, I think it's probably the wrong, um, the wrong place. It's not there uh, as a cost savings exercise. It's there to offer flexibility. Um, if that's your fundamental move to cloud and general public cloud, you're probably in the wrong place. Um, it's you know if you don't deploy it right, if you don't manage it properly, it can cost you a lot of money. But you need to know and understand those considerations when deploying solutions like this. Um, and it's not obviously just unique to Citrix and Citrix workloads. It's it's unique to any virtual environment held within the cloud. And I guess there's different you know pricing options out there. We previously covered all those different subscriptions. So you can you can I guess buy the subscription that best meets your need. Um, and organizations can also try the kind of um, the virtual apps essentials and the virtual desktops essential services within Azure. These are um, marketplace offerings where um, 
they're not um, Citrix Cloud, but they're Citrix within Azure, and they're automated uh, deployments and at a cheaper cost. So that may fit within some people's um, cost uh, model. Um, the speed of uh, deployment, you know, versus traditional, you know, the hours versus the weeks can't be underestimated, especially if, if people are under pressure to get solutions deployed out or to increase workload because of unexpected issues in the organization or a b busy times of the years. Um, and that kind of covers that next point of alleviating short-term burst requirements when additional workload is needed. Um, if we look at public cloud specifically, and we, we look about um, smart scale and auto scale, it's deploying intelligence to your workload in the public cloud that you understand that you can shut these servers down at night whenever the users aren't using them and the, the tool sets exist and whole, have existed for years with Citrix that the cost savings can be made in the cloud because most of the time the environment won't be used because it'll be the middle of the night so why should you be paying a virtual machine in, in Azure um, when no one's actually using it and that's when you can employ these tools such as autoscale to actually go and shut these machines down, keep 10% of the environment up where, in case someone comes in, and then at 7 a.m. in the morning, scale the environment up again. And this can be done on a daily, weekly basis. Um, and obviously, you know, cloud services is moving, I guess, from the traditional CapEx investment of buying large amount of servers and installations to more OPEX-based costs. Fears of, uh, I guess, security um, and compliance. You know, so there's different Citrix Cloud uh, regions out there. So it's been deployed in America, uh, the European Union, Asia Pacific, and Jap Japan. Uh, as I kind of slightly mentioned before, the metadata is the only thing exchanged between the cloud connector and the cloud. Data still resides uh, with customers, and Citrix has deployed bespoke, not bespoke, but the cloud um, instances for specific reasons. So that prime example there being they have deployed a, a specific um, solution for government in the US to meet specifically regulatory and compliance requirements. Um, so from a security point of view, it's, you know, there's there's very little there to be worried about doing this, considering the data, where the data resides is mainly your choice. And then Citrix Cloud has introduced new features to help improve the performance and reliability. So it's essentially built on Azure platform, so which offers 99.5% SLA. And additional features that have really come in the last um, while is the delegated administration, the local host cache, and the configuration and logging, which are all fundamental features that were required, I think, to get any enterprise um, deployments underway, um, especially around the, the local host cache. And we'll, we'll cover that off uh, on one or two slides coming forth. So what's new um, in Citrix Cloud, uh, really in the last six, seven months, the local host cache. So because Citrix Cloud exists, I guess, on the internet uh, in the cloud, what happens if that connection to the cloud disappears? That's essentially where your local host cache functionality comes in. This functionality is part of the existing um, on-premises product, but it was um, adopted for in the event of the connection to your database was interrupted. Fundamentally, that same thing happens. So in your cloud connector, there is a local copy of SQL, uh, SQL Express, that maintains the sync between the Citrix cloud um, database and your local on-premises um, uh, cloud connector with the, the local database there. And in the event that someone is um, accessing um, and brokering a connection, if Citrix Cloud is unavailable, that then fails back to that local database and your cloud connector will continue to broker your changes. What you won't be able to do is make any major changes, you know, publishing machine catalogs and delivery groups, et cetera, but it keeps the service still running. Um, I will call out though, that there is um, some requirement. They, they have some uh, on-premise infrastructure. They accommodate that, especially if you choose to deploy the storefront and the NetScaler service in the cloud. And I guess the, the local uh, elements that are required is the local, a local storefront is required to broker your connection. And if you provide remote access, local NetScaler is required um, if providing remote access. So these have to exist within your resource locations in order, I guess, to keep the show on the road um, and to keep the cloud connector still brokering. If you've moved every uh, your storefront 
and your gateway service, if you just decide to use that within Citrix Cloud, then you will have lost access, which is the, this additional flexibility of providing some on-premise um, uh, VMs to accommodate that particular um, issue uh, occurring if you've got lost lost access to Citrix Cloud. And that could be just down to um, internet connectivity issues. It could be down to someone digging the robe up and cutting the cable. You know, There's various reasons why you could potentially use it and local host caches is, is fundamentally there to make sure the, the brokering still happens. Delegated uh, administration was the kind of next topic. So um, this was a fundamental um, uh, gotcha up until uh, I think last September. There was two options, full admin um, and read only, and there was nothing in between. Which means that you, you know, if you were a service desk user, um, you would have to be have had to be given full access to the whole environment. For example, to log off a particular user because they had a hung session. What they have introduced is more uh, flexibility um, around delegated administration, and that allows you to get to the same level that you have on your your on-premises product. Um, and deliver the kind of roles and scope that you particularly need for each um, specific environment. So we've got, you know, um, the ability on a per deployment uh, or delivery group, a machine catalog to allocate certain um, users and members specific rights to do certain things, you know, such as the help desk role, machine catalog administrator. So that's really helped in, in kind of allowing um, enterprises to go in and have that delegated model of access that is fundamental um, when you have so many people supporting an organization and a Citrix deployment. Configuration logging was a big financial um, sector requirement. Um, there was previously configuration logging um, available, um, but it has actually been, um, it was only available upon request to Citrix support. Um, now that has been added into the, the cloud solution um, and you can actually see what changes have been made by who. That's obviously key um, for traceability. Um, and it was again, one of the blockers that was stopping Citrix Cloud being enterprise deployed. Um, and most recently, as of probably the last month, uh, it had been in tech preview for um, a number of uh, weeks and months before that, but the actual workspace product was lacking any two-factor authentication mechanism that was made available, uh, I think, uh, mid-May. So you can actually um, sign into your Citrix workspace, which is your uh, gateway service um, in relation to Citrix Cloud. And you can choose if your um, cloud instance is um, has two-factor authentication. Um, and you can sign up for that two-factor authentication when you register. Um, and again, that two-factor authentication can be added in to, for example, the Microsoft Authenticator to provide a true um, secure solution going through that gateway product. And again, you know, security being um, pretty key in most organizations, it was seen as uh, one of the key factors for not using that gateway service, the lack of two-factor authentication. But again, that's changed in the, uh, just in the last month and that, that blocker has now been removed. Licensing, so you know your virtual apps and desktops. We can see there's multiple um, different um, ways of viewing this, and and this slide. So it's given you a lot more granularity on what licenses have been assigned, what you have, what the availability is, what's actively used, and it actually give you trends. You know, it actually trends out how much has been used in particular months. So you, I guess you can adapt your, your license and they, they kind of um, understand how many users you will need if you're seeing a, a, an upward trend that you can accommodate it before we get the message that, you know, there's no more licenses. So there's a lot more um, granularity and insight around licensing uh, when you move to the, the, the Citrix Cloud model itself. So uh, what I've seen in, in the field, I guess, of, of various different deployments, and there's various different reasons um, people will, will deploy a cloud. So they, they buy Citrix Cloud due to the cost reduction versus renewal of licenses with support now included. So um, any, any new um, uh, deployment or any new traditional license renewal didn't always have to have the support included. It now has to have it included. And whenever you factor up um, the subscription-based model with Citrix and they kind of they're pushed towards the Citrix Cloud model. I've seen a lot of the times where the um, 
the renewal of the traditional license is more expensive in some cases than renewing with the cloud subscription. And that could be a point in time Citrix offer. Um, but you know, bearing in mind, it, it could also only last for three years. Um, it can be a reason why people deploy um, and go to that Citrix licensing model. Um, and what they've called out as well is whenever you sign up to that model, you've got hybrid use rights. So fundamentally, you're given a period of time, usually two years, to move your control plane to the cloud. Not your resource locations where your, your workload is, but your control plane. So once you buy that licensing, it, they will allow you up to two years to move into that position. You're getting the benefit of the, the licensing and all our features around the workspace product. And then you can move, I guess, in your own time within that two year period. I've seen it, you know, just deploying the Citrix control plane and leaving everything on premise. That's totally acceptable. Um, it's, you know, the flexibility of choice is great. And then it's deploying Citrix control plane um, and migrating gradually to the providers. So as you come up for a refresh cycle on your hardware, you decide to move to public cloud, in which case you're, you're doing a gradual drain of your hardware on site and increasing your public use. Uh, your public cloud usage and then deploying Citrix Cloud and moving um, virtual apps to uh, the cloud and hosting virtual desktops on premise. If we look at the cost of VDIs, um, it's a one to one relationship. It can be quite expensive to deploy a large VDI farm um, for one to one basis. So some people will, I guess, benefit it uh, and use the, the, um, the choice that you have of deploying one with your on-premise versus uh, deploying um, maybe your uh, non-VDI and your terminal servers in the cloud where you can get uh, greater sca scalability and more cost savings around that. If we look at the different um, the comparison bit with on-premise versus the cloud, you know, there's a fe the feature gap is reducing, you know, especially over the past 12 months. There are some limitations out there that you know we, we have to call out. So the gateway service, you know, has a number of limitations. You know, customization is limited. You can't customize it like you can on the on-premises. There's no logging available. ADT, which is good latency environments, isn't available at the moment. Um, it's only the standard ICA. You don't have the ability to do um, smart access, which is why a lot of organizations would still continue, especially in the enterprise, enterprise organizations, continue to deploy a local gateway product and then essentially reach across into the public cloud in order to um, get their desktop or their app. There's no AppV um, integration, um, but I don't think that's fundamentally a, a key reason anybody would move to Citrix or would cause any great concern. Um, and there's some issues around session printing. So if you use the Citrix policies to do session based mapping um, and tie it to a print server, the cloud connector is actually unable to connect to that particular print server in order to generate that. So there are just some small um, things that just need to, need to be considered as well. When you um, want to deploy Active Directory, if you're in a very good environment where you've only got one domain controller, um, it's going to be pretty easy. You deploy two um, cloud connectors. If you have a multiple domain environment, it really then depends on, two, uh, on one, of, one of two things. If it's um, a domain trust, uh, the domain trust, the cloud connector can't understand the domain trust. So therefore, you would have to do it um, and deploy Citrix Cloud um, VMs in each domain. If you have a forest trust um, between them, um, then that's when things can come a bit easier. So it, the cloud connector is able to then to, um, broker the connection to the different domains from one set of cloud connectors um, being stored locally. So, you know, it is um, it is something to factor in whenever you're designing your, your Citrix cloud environment uh, where Active Directory plays a part in it and how complex you can get around that. Um, ideally, you know, uh, large organizations tend to have large complex AEs um, they just need to factor these into the, in, in the, the considerations. And how does actually Citrix Cloud update? So there's two environments that they have, release A and release B. You know, updates are applied to release A first, then customers are migrated into this environment. Um, then the update is applied to the remaining environment, release B. 
So generally, there's only early adopters ever fit in the release A first, in which case that they will get the features first. They'll essentially be the um, the nice users and that will call out any issues. They'll have nominated themselves to be one of those early adopters. And then traditionally, everybody else would be in the release B, in which case through a period of time, you know, two to three weeks, um, that they would move in to the updated release um, environment um, on a gradual basis. And obviously they would review any issues that arise or any complaints that they would have whenever you really move into that particular version. And worst case, it'll actually regress out completely. How do you monitor Citrix Cloud? So we've a few different ways there. So we've the um, service health dashboard, it's available on status.cloud.com with various different subscriptions. Um, you can do Slack, SMS, webhooks, Teams, and then you can actually check uh, the connector health itself. So you can go in and check the status of all these. And that's how you, you can monitor what the status is of, is of Citrix Cloud itself. Um, there are other third products third-party products out there, such as EG Innovations and Control Up, that can actually monitor the connections in the Citrix Cloud in a lot more granular detail, if that would be required. Uh, just to kind of start the call out, so as of, I think, a uh, stat uh, in the last um, 30 days, there's on average per day 900 application launches being done by the brokering in the cloud itself. So it has been fairly widely used and that 900K figure is obviously in an upward, upward trajectory and will only increase through the, the future adoption of the, the Citrix Cloud model itself. How do you migrate your existing policies? Pretty easy. There's some tools that have been developed out by people um, in the general Citrix community. You know, do you recreate your farm structure, scans your current farm and recreates your machine catalogs. Um, it exports your policies and imports them into the new farm, both on-premises and six cloud. So there are tools out there to help um, migrate some of those probably lesser forgotten things, but more importantly, the ones that um, Citrix admins care about most is, is having that low level uh, ability to actually migrate some of the policies across. So we'll kind of go on to the final section here um, is really around public cloud pricing. You need to understand your various different options um, around the VMs that you select. So there's two real main VMs that from a Microsoft Azure point of view, I'll give as, as the example. F16 is a server with a high density of users, high cost, but with the density of users, um, it obviously reduces the, uh, the amount per user cost would be. Um, and if we look at the D2v2, it's a low cost and a low uh, density of users. So obviously the compute is the, you know, the cost is derived from the users per server it will impact the total number of servers required. You factor in all those calculations and the number of server VDIs times the number of hours that they're switched on times the per uh, hour unit cost of computing Azure is how you understand your compute cost. And understanding the number of hours that you have them on can give you a lot of savings when you implement products such as smart scale and auto scale. You also have to be aware of storage costs. So when you have a VM cost that doesn't include your storage, you do get certain elements of a temporary storage assigned to it, but you have to pay for standard storage and it's you know based on the number of users by the expected IOPS, by the storage account um, cost per 10,000 to give you that storage cost from a standard storage point of view. If you look at premium storage, there's a set charge for a size per month. You have to pay for the additional disks that you add into that VM and that has to be factored in. And I guess the third one is the network. You're not charged for anything coming in to your Azure platform, you're charged in it going out. So you have to understand the number of users that you have by the outgoing bandwidth per hour, per month, to understand the actual network cost that, that you do. So looking up um, the cost of 10 VMs, uh, compute VMs in Azure isn't enough to actually give you a, a good cost, to be honest. So you need to have a good understanding of how all that works, um, how you're gonna connect into Azure in order to understand what your total cost is if you go to public cloud. And if we look at some um, different options that you have around uh, specifically Azure, you know, there is three different models there, pay and go, 
one year reserved, three year reserved. So if you look at um, the pinch point, it's around 17 hours um, from when it would be um, more sensible to move to a one year model as uh, so a 20, 21 hours um, to go to the three year reserve model. So there's, you know, if you're, if you only have them in uh, on and switched on maybe nine or 10 hours a day, the pay, pay as you go could offer more flexibility. Um, but what I will say is Microsoft Azure is based on Microsoft um, enterprise agreements and licensing, and you will have um, special um, offers that Microsoft can do around Azure pricing um, and around those one year and three year reserved. So it, it, that's usually a Microsoft discussion on, on the best price you can get for that. The more generally accessible pricing is obviously the one that everyone gets if you go pay and go. And if we look at a recommended Azure sizing based on the current kind of scalability figures, the F16 SV2 was previously the D2V2 is now coming out as the most cost effective. But what I will do is caveat that. Although most effective per user, you need to shut them down. And when you have a higher number of users on the box, it's going to be more um, harder to get that box shut down. Um, if someone is on on working late till seven, eight at night. So make sure that you have like your um, idle time and disconnect times on those VMs, because if there's a user on there, the VM will not shut down and you will be charged that public um, cloud cost for keeping that still running. That's when you need to, you know, evaluate each environment, evaluate what, you know, your work hours are and evaluate what are actually smaller VMs is, going to be more flexible or going to actually reduce the cost because the lower number of people you have in the box the easier you'll be able to shut a number of those boxes down and i'll just finally go through i guess um some demos and it's really around a cost model for uh, citrix azure um we did have some other demos to go through but i think we can probably skip that just hold on So um, we've developed, uh, I guess, a, a cloud, uh, Citrix Cloud and Azure cost estimate. I'll caveat, this is an estimate. It's not a, accurate, but it gives you a general view of how much things will cost. So if we look here um, at particular um, inputs that we've added, so we've chosen to deploy um, 100 um, HSDs, the, the hosted shared desktops on the particular VM that is recommended. Um, we've chosen to select 100 um, VDIs, um, virtual desktops. We've estimated that you know there's um, the users work 37 hours a week. Um, that's 160 hours a month, uh, or yeah, 160 per month, the total hours per month. Um, there's other elements there, such as the IOPS that we've adjusted. We want the VDIs to be on premium disks. Um, we want high availability. Um, so we want this split between UK South data center and UK West, uh, which means that if we uh, are splitting it across, we want some DR capability. We've called that out as 50%, which means you know we've got 500 um, HSDs available in the second data center and 50 of the VDIs. Um, we'll keep the smart scaling, auto scaling off for the moment, um, just so we can see the price comparison. And then we've selected some of the core requirements. So the um, type of cloud connector VM that we've chosen, whether we need storefront or net scalers or domain controllers, selected no to those. We've chosen the particular premium disk that we want and um, the type of provisioning method that we're going to use, um, the identity disk type um, that we're going to use, and then we're not going to um, have any express routes. So if we look at the summary of what that's actually going to cost, 
um, we've got a, a fairly good view of um, the amount of users that we're provisioning it for. You can see the um, number of virtual apps servers um, that will require, um, which is B23, um, the number of virtual uh, desktop. Um, if we look at the split between the D two DCs, we can see that. We can look at the standard um, workload cost versus um, the standard uh, virtual apps cost versus the uh, virtual desktop costs, how much that's going to cost per month and um, how much is that that's going to cost per data center. Um, and you can see a full estimated cost there of how much the core infrastructure is going to cost per user, um, how much the um, standard HSD virtual apps will cost per user, how much that will be with the infrastructure. So you'll see that 9.31. And if we look at the VDA, you can see how much a VDI being deployed including the VDI cost and the core infrastructure um, would be, if you look at the price comparison of those two, you can see why you can see VDI could be a very expensive cost versus your, your HSD. And then you can see the total per month of what that's going to cost. So from an Azure point of view, deploying with those particular metrics, you know, we can see, you know, the total cost being a 29,000 per month. And that's all done through various cost calculations of um, how many hours these are switched on, et cetera. So if I go back and switch on smart scaling, um, if we all remember, it shuts our machines down on at night. Um, if we set that up with a 30% allowance for the machines to be shut down, 10% on VDA, we'll go back to the cost calculator and we can see um, the cost reductions. So you can see there um, from uh, an Azure cost summary point of view, the cost starting to actually reduce down based on being able to shut them down. Um, so if anybody wants a copy of that, if they, they want to reach out um, to me, um, I'll uh, make sure my email gets sent out to everyone or I'll drop everyone an email. Uh, feel free to use this particular calculator just to estimate how much public code costs. And I guess that probably concludes um, the presentation. Uh, thanks everybody for attending.